Chapter 1, Part 1 October 19th, 2.30 p.m. Royce, Nebraska Eli Watkins walked home from the game. He had been the star athlete in his game of football, and he had played like a pro. His parents were alcoholics and lay in bed drunk while he played his heart out. Eli took his time walking home. Why would he rush? His parents wouldn't know either way whether he was there or not. They wouldn't care. Hey, Eli, how'd the game go? The older man with a rake in his hand was a friend to Eli. Eli had done some chores for him in the past for extra money and had done some free work also because of the friendship. It went pretty good, Mr. Jones. We won. Eli finally had someone to brag to. Good, I knew you would, son. Eli waved goodbye and kept walking. Part 2. 3.30 p.m. Jonas C. Clare had a two-bit job, which amounted to crap in his book, but it paid, and pay was hard to come by these days. He folded the blanket and placed it on the shelf in the closet. His job was to make sure the blankets, sheets, and pillowcases were clean, folded, and put in the closet for the patients in this nursing home. It was a simple job, really, but boring for Jonas, and he wished with all he was that he had gone into the service or something instead of settling for this piece of shit job. It was a job, though, and Jonas knew he had to stick with it. He closed the closet door and pushed the cart down the long hallway to another closet, where he would gather some more dirty blankets and some more dirty sheets and pillowcases and he would then push the cart to the laundry room and wash them all and repeat the process for eight more hours. Jonas pushed the cart toward the elevator. The wheels squeaked unmercifully, and he thought he might choke the next passerby he saw if it didn't stop. Pushing the button to open the elevator, he stepped back once again behind his cart and waited. Part 3 Monday, October 19th, 3.45 p.m. Rebecca Morris pushed as hard as she could. The baby was being stubborn and not wanting to face this world on this day. Rebecca, as she pushed till her veins looked as though they'd bust, thought to herself the baby probably liked the warmth of her body and the peace and quiet it held, and it dawned on her that if she could actually keep him inside her and protect him forever, she probably would. Push, Rebecca. Push hard, girl. The doctor was an unfeeling son of a bitch, and Rebecca thought that if she could, she would kick his bright white teeth clean out of his mouth. October 19th, 3.50 p.m. Joe Donner moved slowly. His arthritis was acting up so bad today, he felt like giving up. Between his age and his arthritis, he was barely able to do the things he needed to do each day. It was this way every day until he had taken his medicine and drank his coffee, and then, after about an hour, he would feel brand new. Joe was a security guard for the hospital. He'd worked at the same hospital for 30 years. He had never once contemplated changing jobs. To change jobs would mean to change his lifestyle, and Joe was not up for that. Never had been. He was a very habitual and very set-in-his-ways kind of man, and he was not as old as he looked. No, he was a mere sixty years old, but he was God-fearing, and he knew it was just about his time to say goodbye to this cruel world, goodbye to all the pain and heartache. Jeremiah Jones hid behind a wall that led to the church building. This was a new church, and it did look poor, which was all the more reason for him to burn it. Jeremiah was not mentally capable of knowing right from wrong. He was incapacitated emotionally and mentally. It was an illness yet to be named, and quite frankly, no one cared enough to study it. He had been thrown away. No dealing with his kind at all. 
Jeremiah had found his way out during a fire at the institution, a fire that he set killing patients and workers the same as they tried desperately to escape. Now, here he hid, ready to burn another building to the ground, unknowing if anyone was inside and, quite honestly, not caring. Part 4 Tabby Nichols reached across this seat of the car as she darted through town trying to get to the karaoke bar before 7 p.m. Her cigarettes hit the floor and so she grabbed aimlessly in the dark. Damn it! She quickly looked ahead at the light which was still green and reached down on the floorboard swiping her hand back and forth in search of her smokes. The sound of an explosion brought her to a sitting position quickly. She slammed on her brakes just like everyone else on that road. She saw that many vehicles had rear-ended other vehicles in the midst of the noise and slamming of brakes. Luckily, she had not been slammed into yet. Tabby shut her car off and jumped out. She stood beside the car and looked around at all the other cars sitting still around her. She raised hands and shoulders to one man sitting in his car right behind her, as if to say, what the hell? He made no gestures back at her, though. He just sat there with a blank stare on his face. Tabby shook her head and looked the other way, trying to make eye contact with someone. Anyone in order to maybe get an idea of what had happened. But no one seemed to be looking at her. She walked to the car right in front of hers and tapped lightly on the woman's window. The other woman didn't move. The knock on the window didn't faze her. Tabby looked at her, and the look on her own face was completely a look of awe. Hmm, I'll be, Tabby thought to herself as she turned to walk back to her own car. She stopped short of the door when she noticed the man behind her had left his own car and was now at the window of the car behind his, beating on their window. Tabby could see the woman and child inside that car screaming and trying to stay away from the window the man was beating on in a rage. Tabby's eyes became wide and, for a moment, she could not fathom why this man would be doing this. Could it be his ex-wife? Maybe even his sister or her girlfriend and his child. But the look on the woman and her kid's face let Tabby know immediately that it was none of those possibilities at all. Then, just as she was about to walk over and try to help the woman, she got a whiff of something floating through the air. It was not sweet-smelling or even sour-smelling. It smelled like burning metal, and she knew. She knew it was poison. Oh, my God. Tabby reached for her own car door and stopped. Why would she ever get back into that car that was trapped between all those other cars? How would she escape this, being trapped between all of these other cars? Tabby quickly looked back to the car behind hers, where the man was still beating the window. The child inside was screaming and crying and clinging to his mother, who was shocked and scared and crying also. Tabby could not leave them like this. She could not abandon that child. She knew that God would not forgive her if she did. Hell, she wouldn't be able to forgive herself. Tabby slowly walked to the front of the other car and stood still, looking at the child inside and then looking at the maniac beating on the window. What was wrong with him? What the hell was wrong with him? Just as she thought this, a man from three cars down walked up to the man beating on the window, and just as the window cracked, the other man yanked the first guy away from the window and took a big bite out of his face. Tabby screamed. This was more than she could even fathom. It then dawned on her. What was happening was so visible it was insane. That smell in the air that she knew was poison was turning people into cannibals. She ran to the passenger side of the car behind her and yelled through the closed window, over and above the screams inside the car. Open the door and get out. Open the door. The woman reached over and did as she was told by Tabby, opening the door. Tabby reached in and grabbed the child to pull him out, sitting him on her own hip. 
The small boy held on tightly, and the mother was in the car screaming. Come here, lady, get out now before you get us all killed, Tabby yelled. Tabby could plainly see the fear that was so evident on her face. Tabby held on tight to the small boy, holding him in one arm as she reached out the other to help his mom get out. She felt her blood pressure rise from fear. The mother stood beside the car, beside Tabby who was holding her son. As they looked at the man clawing at the driver door, they could not believe their own eyes. Their minds wreaked havoc on their own mental state, because what was happening was not something they could understand. Mommy, Mommy, please come on, her son was yelling as Tabby ran with him in her arms. Tabby knew if they didn't go now, they may not go at all.